Good afternoon. Welcome to the Asian Impact webinar from the Asian Development Bank. I'm Karen Lane from the Department of Communications. Today we've gathered a number of economists from across the bank to discuss the economic prospects for developing Asia as we glimpse a little bit of light at the end of the COVID-19 tunnel, but with many economies, many countries still facing enormous uncertainties. ADB has just today released its latest edition of its flagship economic report, the Asian Development Outlook. It's on ADB's website, www.adb.org. But we have here today Yasu, uh, Yasuyuki Sawada. He's ADB's chief economist, who's going to take us through some of the key messages. After that, it's over to you, the audience. Um, you'll be able to uh, pose questions both to Yasu and to our other panelists who we have gathered today. They are Abdul Abiyad. He is the Director of Macroeconomic Research in ADB's Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department, Liaziza Savirova. She is the Principal Regional Economist with our Central and West Asian Department, and Lele Song, Regional Economic Advisor with our South Asian Department. So we have a very wide geographic span for you today. Please pose your questions in the Q&A box on the right hand side. Um, please like any questions that you see that mirror your own because we will be getting to the most popular questions first, but we will of course try to answer as many as we can in the hour that we have. So with that, if I can please pass over to Yasu, if you can take us through the key messages um, of the ADO, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Karen. Uh, Good day, everyone. Um, I'd like to use uh, my uh, slides. Um, so Asian Development Outlook 2021. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, start by stating uh, five key messages of uh, uh, Asian Development Outlook, or in short, ADO 2021. First, renewed COVID-19 outbreaks show the pandemic is far from beaten and vaccination plans are still early stages. Second, recovery paths diverge as uh, exports boost growth in some economies, especially in East Asia, while containment and travel restrictions uh, restrain in others. Third, developing Asia's growth will rebound to 7.3% in 2021 and 5.3% in 2022. Inflation will remain muted at 2.3% in 2021 and 2.7% next year, 2022. Fourth, the main risk stems from the pandemic, including a renewed outbreaks or delayed vaccine rollouts. Finally, but not, not least, uh, the report's the same chapter, Financing a Green and Inclusive Recovery, documents the rapid rise of uh, a green and social finance and the positive impacts of it can bring. We will cover this in a separate webinar uh, next month. So now uh, let me um, uh, quickly uh, go over uh, the progress, uh, uh, evolution of uh, uh, pandemic and progress of uh, vaccine rollouts. Uh, black line on the left chart shows the uh, new COVID-19 cases in developing Asia. Uh, you can see picked up uh, 106,000 last September, successful containment reduced it down to uh, 32,000 by end of February, 2021. But in part, because of new variants, cases surged again to 93,000 by end of March, the cutoff date of uh, ADO. It has continued rising uh, since then. Uh, this highlights that the uh, pandemic is far from over. The right chart shows the vaccine rollouts are still in a very early stages and progress in the region varies uh, quite considerably. Many economies are facing these difficulties in procurement of deployment, de procurement and deployment. Uh, while a handful of small economies, you can see on the top of the uh, bars uh, on the right-hand chart, have vaccinated a substantial share of their population, most large regional economies have not. Developing Asia has administered 5.2 doses per 100 people below the global average of 7.7 .7 uh, per 100 people. Amid the pandemic is up and ups and downs, Asia is experiencing an economic revival, though an uneven one. 
GDP growth in Q4 2020, uh, shown in the white dots in this chart, improved relative to growth in Q1 to Q3 last year, yellow dots uh, shown in this uh, chart. Um, eight out of a region's 10 largest, largest economies uh, shown here, we see this um, uh, 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 recovery of uh, GDP last year. Q4 improvements was particularly strong in the region's two largest economies, uh, uh, PRC and India, you can see from the uh, left end. Improvements came on the both domestic and external front. Contributions from private consumption, blue bars in this chart, and the investment orange, orange bars became less negative or turned positive for seven out of 10 economies here, listed here. On the external front, net exports uh, shown in the gray bars were also bigger a boost to uh, growth in Q4 uh, 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 in uh, seven out of uh, 10 economies in this chart. This recovery is supported by a robust manufacturing revival. The left chart shows the Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index or PMI uh, manufacturing activity increased steadily through the late uh, 2020, both globally shown in a blue line, left chart, and also in PRC, India, and rest of developing Asia, uh, respectively green, red, and the black lines. And uh, it remains in expansionary territory in early 2021. This has gone hand in hand with strengthening uh, trade. Global and regional export have rebound, uh, as you can see from the right chart, black and green lines on the right, uh, respectively for global exports and regional exports. But they have sought for uh, the PRC shown in the red line. Export recovery was first driven by surging uh, exports of uh, medical supplies and protective equipment, PPEs, and then by electronics uh, products. But this meant the benefit were unevenly spread. Uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia economy that export these products saw so strong gains, but the performance in Central and South Asia was less good. Remittances in the region were also relatively resilient and did not collapse by 20%. Some had forecast at the beginning of pandemic. In the first three quarters of 2020, Developing Asia's remittances were actually up 0.7% year on year, as we can see from the left chart. And uh, especially in Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Azerbaijan, remittances increased quite substantially. But they declined in some Central Asian economies where remittances are large, uh, larger share of GDP. Unfortunately, tourism show little sign of bouncing back, uh, as we can see from the right chart. Tourism arrivals have remained depressed since April and have risen only in Maldives, uh, as you can see from the red line in the right chart. Um, and um, uh, Maldives opened last July, but even there, international tourism arrivals are still down 40%. In other economies, tourist, tourist arrivals are still down 90% or uh, 100% contributing to severe recessions in tourism de dependent economies, such as Georgia, Maldives, Thailand, and several Pacific Island economies. The improving economic situation, as well as substantial monetary and fiscal support has led to improving financial conditions in the region. Left chart in this slide documents continued narrowing of spreads in regional bond markets. We don't, sh we don't show it here, but the equity market also showed the gains and FDI foreign direct investment and portfolio capital flows into the region continued. Right hand side chart, orange bars uh, shows the majority of uh, Asian currencies strengthened against the US dollar since uh, 1st October, 2020. However, some currencies weakened during the uh, period, uh, the ones near the bottom showing uh, right chart. Um, uh, these countries, including uh, Lao, Kip, uh, Myanmar, Chad, Sri Lanka rupees, and several Central Asian currencies. So looking forward, the outlook for growth is positive. After 0.2% regional contraction in 2020, progress on vaccination rollouts and recovering global demand will foster rapid economic recovery in developing Asia. Growth is forecast at 7.3% in 2021, as I mentioned at the beginning, 
much higher than average growth in pre-COVID situation 2015 to 2019 because of, because of the uh, comparison with the weak 2020 baseline. Regional growth will moderate to 5.2% in 2022 next year, excluding a newly industrialized economies. Regional growth is forecast at 7.7% .7 this year and 5.6% next year. The growth tra trajectory will not be uniform across subregions, as you, you can see from this uh, table. Central Asia, Southeast Asia, and Pacific are projected to see moderate growth this year picking up in 2022. On the other hand, some deceleration is expected in next year, 2022, in East Asia and Southeast Asia uh, after rapid growth this year. One can also see this uh, divergent recovery path by looking not at the growth rate, but GDP levels. For the region as a whole, left end chart, um, after the mild contraction last year, the rebound in growth will still leave GDP level below its uh, pre-pandemic trend. In other words, recovery will be incomplete. Within the region, GDP trajectory for the PRC green line, second from the left one, looks uh, quite good. There was no decline last year and it will get close to trend by next year. Contrast that with India, uh, blue line, uh, third one from the uh, left, which experienced a large contraction in 2020. So despite this sharp rebound this year, GDP level remains well below its pre-pandemic trend. For the rest of developing Asia, purple line, uh, uh, right end chart, contraction last year was not so sharp, but the rebound is also so uh, uh, more modest. Turning to inflation, inflation in the region will remain muted during the forecast horizon over two years, this year and next year. Uh, rising international community, despite the rising uh, international community prices, substantial slack in many economies will keep a lid on uh, inflation pressures. Average inflation in developing Asia is forecast to 4 to 2.3% in 2021 from 2.8% in 2020 last year, uh, mostly driven by lower food prices and lower food price inflation in India and the PRC. Prices are forecast to rise uh, by 2.7% uh, in 2022. The current environment is highly uncertain, so risks remain tilted towards the, the downside. The main risk to the outlook is an unfavorable evolution of the pandemic. Significant and protracted outbreaks may require new mo mobility restrictions. Vaccine rollouts may face challenges to uh, pro in procurement, deployment, vaccine hesitancy, or weak effectiveness against the new variants. Other downward, downside risks uh, include geopolitical tensions, primarily between the US and PRC, political turmoil, supply chain bottlenecks, and tightening financial condition, including a possible repeat of the TEPA tantrum. There is also the risk of longer term scarring uh, from the pan pandemic. A special analysis in the report examines learning and earning losses arising from the, uh, the uh, pandemic induced the school closures. So uh, let me briefly describe this uh, 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 impact on uh, education uh, now. The COVID-19 pandemic has severely disrupted education. Schools were close to varying degrees. In a quarter of the regional economies, schools were closed for 200 up to 300 days. And in another fifth, they were closed for a year or more. Only a handful of economies managed to keep school open continuously. Remote learning strategies were used, but many students are constrained by limited access to computers and the internet. Our analysis find Students in Asia have so far lost 29% of a year of learning on average. Learning losses are varied across the region. In South Asia, where closures have been the longest, students lost 55% of a year of learning. Schools mostly stayed open in the Pacific, where learning losses were relatively low at 8%.
these learning losses will reduce future productivity and earnings. Our estimates show students affected by school closures tend to lose on average of 180 US dollars or 2.4% decline uh, in expected annual earnings. Then we computed the present value of these future earning losses and they aggregated up to an estimate of 1.25 trillion US dollars for entire developing Asia, which is equivalent to 5.4% of the region's GDP in year 2020. These learning and earning losses will rise the longer that the school remains closed. The analysis discusses the policies that can be adapted to help mitigate a potential damage and to ensure education systems emerge from the pandemic better than that were before. So in order to recap the key messages uh, here, uh, pandemic is far from beaten, recovery past diverge in the region, developing Asia's growth will rebound and uh, main risk still stem from the pandemic. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, I'm happy to take question at this point. Thank you, thank you very much. Over to you, Karen. Thank you very much, Yang. Thank you, Yasu. Certainly a lot to think about there, um, both in the short term and uh, in the longer term. And I'm seeing that we've got some questions coming in already. Now, you mentioned um, during your presentation that uh, you assess the situation as of the end of March. Um, and I think the first question that we've got in is, uh, is very important and speaks to that. Um, it's from Rohan. He, he asks whether uh, the um, early indications um, of the surge in COVID cases in India will affect uh, the ADO growth forecast for India, which I think is 11% for 2021 and 7% for uh, 2022. Um, but I think, um, you know, Rohan mentions India, but I think that's also true of, of several other countries as well. Uh, maybe you want to say a couple of words and then I could ask Lele because I do know that he's sitting in Delhi. So you may think uh, our uh, forecast uh, this year, especially for um, uh, East Asia and also 11% um, uh, growth forecast for India, you may think this is uh, uh, um, uh, overestimated, but uh, actually this is a reflection of a uh, uh, very uh, deep uh, recession last year. And uh, this year's forecast, we compare last year uh, contraction to uh, rebound. So naturally we see a higher number um, uh, uh, across the board uh, in our uh, growth forecast. Uh, and India, India is not the ex exception. And um, um, actually uh, uh, surge in uh, COVID cases in India is quite worrisome. Uh, but uh, not only this uh, base uh, effect, but also other reasons, uh, government policies in vaccine rollouts, and uh, also um, uh, lockdown policy uh, became uh, more fine-tuned. So I think uh, uh, Indian number is still achievable and realistic. But uh, uh, let, let me hand over uh, to Lele uh, to speak more on India. Lele, please go ahead. How are things in Delhi? Much. Yeah, thank you very much, Karen, and thanks for the question. And I'm speaking to you from Delhi. And this is really indeed a sovereign moment for India. And uh, the situations are green. You read from the news and heartbreaking and the people in hospitals and short off for oxygen. So uh, I think our praise and thoughts are with the Indian people. And as uh, Sawada Stan said, yeah, our forecast 11% was made in late March, but uh, with uh, so there would be a, a significant uh, downside risk to this forecast, but we are very hopeful. The recovery is still intact, helped by the fast vaccine rollout, because now uh, April is still a very early day in the fiscal year of 2021 to 2022, first of the month. The Indian fiscal year starts from April to March. So this is only the first of the month. So there's a long way uh, ahead. And probably the situation would be worsening before uh, improving because uh, uh, the cases are so high, positivity rates are so higher. So we are still hopeful and uh, the India the recovery would be intact. So I'll hand back to you, Karen. Thank you. Thanks. I, I actually um, think I should pass it over also to Abdul because as I said earlier, it's not just India that's seeing this uh, recent surge. Abdul, any any. Any comments from your side? Uh, 
Absolutely. So first, let me continue just on India to elaborate as well. So Yasu had mentioned the base effect. So growth will be high because 2020 was a very weak uh, year. The other thing, and Lele already mentioned vaccine rollouts in India. India is one of the countries in developing Asia that's doing quite well in its vaccine rollouts above the global average. Um, right now, they're vaccinating th uh, three million. They're they're administering three million doses a day in India, so they're on track to hit their target of 300 million vaccinations by August and uh, uh, widespread vaccination by uh, fiscal year 2022. A, a third factor is that the um, the containment measures being put in place now are more selective and targeted in contrast to the large-scale lockdowns that were put in place last year. And it really makes a difference. One, one indicator of that, for example, is if you look at mobility indicators, you can get them from Google and other sources. So if you look at mobility outside the residence, now it's down about 20 to 30% relative to normal. But last year, it was actually down 60 to 70%. And so again, it, it's, it's a lot of it is relative, right? Yes, it's bad in terms of the, um, the decline in economic activity last year, it was really bad. And so we're still hopeful, as Lele said, that we can reach it. So to um, answer Karen's question, so it, it, India is doing, is you know, grappling with its domestic outbreak, but so are other countries in the region um, here in Southeast Asia, the Philippines, uh, Indonesia, and Thailand uh, have outbreaks in South Asia, apart from India, uh, Bangladesh, and Nepal. And there are other countries uh, throughout the region, even in the Pacific, Fiji, again, it's just getting started, but they're very worried about it there because, again, in terms of capacity to handle these things, these are small island economies, they're not that capable. So Thailand's an interesting example where um, it's, if, it's not, as, it's not a, a very severe outbreak, but it basically killed their hopes for restarting tourism. Phuket was supposed to reopen. They had all these plans of you know, um, letting vaccinated tourists in uh, without quarantine, but that's been killed by it. So it really, it as Yasu said, this is really the biggest downside risk to our forecasts. Thanks, Karen. Did we lose Karen? Or yeah, we, we seem to have lost the moderator, but we've got quite a few questions here coming from the audience. Okay. Uh, let me let me see. We've got this uh, uh, a question coming from Khalid Umar. In case of investment-led economic recovery. Uh, how will this affect uh, debt sustainability in developing Asia? Uh, Yasu, do you want to touch a bit on the, de uh, uh, the debt sustainability question? Yes, uh, I'm happy to respond. Um, uh, and uh, I think developing Asia has a very decisive uh, fiscal response to the pandemic. Uh, there was a, a, actually an origin of uh, uh, increasing uh, public debt. So uh, this is uh, really inevitable or uh, indispensable component to support the economy uh, to, uh, 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 to proceed. Without it, economic and uh, social toll would, would have been uh, quite uh, worse. So, uh, and as a result, um, uh, regions of fiscal deficit uh, doubled uh, last year to 10% of GDP, and also uh, public debt uh, stock rose 10% points to 65% uh, public uh, debt to GDP ratio. Um, I think with the projected strong growth, revenue will uh, increase and deficit will decline. So I think um, uh, most developing Asian economies have uh, manageable uh, public debt levels, 65% uh, debt GDP ratio. If you compare other uh, countries and economy around the globe, I think this is a quite uh, uh, controllable and manageable uh, level. So uh, I think um, um, uh, this is a inevitable or indispensable component to support. And then, of course, uh, at some stage in the future, uh, fiscal expansion policy to support economy. Once um, uh, economic recovery um, um, uh, 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 return back the uh, on track, I think uh, fiscal expansion should be transformed to uh, fiscal consolidation. At that moment, I think uh, also one thing I'd like to mention is uh, uh, strengthening uh, tax revenue and uh, you know broader uh, uh, capacity to. Uh, uh, mobilize the uh, domestic resources, uh, 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 domestic uh, resource mobilization. I think that's a really important component in um, uh, within a couple of years. So I think um, uh, that is actually we need to watch, but I think uh, it's uh, sustainable and manageable in developing Asia. Joe, can I add something to that? 
Oh, Karen's back. <laughs> Karen, can I, I add something? My apologies, my apologies, but it seems like you've got everything under control. Yeah, please go ahead. Go ahead, Abdul. Yes, thank, uh, so just wanted to add to what Yasu was saying. So one of the things is that as one of the slides Yasu showed uh, uh, indicated, it's a it's a quite the balanced recovery um, across the region. It, there's there's support that's emerging from both increasing consumption, increasing investment, and increasing contribution from net exports. So it's uh, unlike, let's say, the recovery during the uh, global financial crisis, where a lot of it, if you look at for the region of, as a whole, a lot of it was driven by it was investment uh, led stimulus, particularly in China. Here again, it's a uh, and the collapse in co consumption last year, um, the normalization and you know, people being able to go out again uh, once, you know, again, once outbreaks are under control means that consumption will contribute, investment will as well, um, once businesses uh, are, are able to resume economic activity. And then exports, Yasu had shown these very nice charts showing how strong exports uh, have been from the region, especially in electronics and um, pandemic related goods. Uh, we expect that as the global economy recovers, even uh, you know other types of goods, textiles, garments, etc., will also see a recovery. So it, it it's not uh, it's not a an unbalanced sectoral recovery. We expect all components of demand to be contributing. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh... Abdul, can I um, toss this over to Liaziza as well? I think, you know, many of the economies in your region, uh, they're commodity based economies and we've seen, you know, uh, rise in demand for oil products, for example. Can you just speak to that a little bit? Sure, thank you very much, Karen. Uh, yes, uh, maybe continuing also a little bit from the public debt um, uh, perspective. Uh, in Central Asia, I also echo what Yasu-san said uh, about this overall situation. Um, for the resource-rich economies, uh, these economies had some fiscal buffers. And for example, Kazakhstan or Azerbaijan, they drew on uh, sovereign wealth funds. Um, so overall, uh, from the public, you know, that point of view, things are quite sustainable and they do not really pose a worry to macroeconomies. However, for smaller countries in our region, in Central Asia, in West Asia, um, like uh, Kyrgyzstan, for example, or Tajikistan, uh, we do watch that. Um, the debt situation increased, uh, governments uh, borrowed more, um, you know, the, the debt level, public debt level is coming to the levels of 50 to 60 percent of GDP. Uh, also, Tajikistan, I think, availed of the uh, debt service sustainability initiative uh, from G20 countries, and they did get some relief on debt service. Um, but I think the most important, it's not just a number, it's really how the new borrowings, how the new debt is being used. If this is for productive use, for uh, addressing uh, pand pandemia and uh, the, this crisis, uh, if the spendings are really for the long-term development purposes for uh, human capital development, for health, public health, uh, education, infrastructure, of course, uh, then this is uh, money well spent. And as Yasu-san said, with longer-term uh, economic growth prospects, um, this macroeconomic situation will and should remain uh, sustainable. Thanks very much, Yaziza. We've got a lot of questions coming in, actually, so I may ask you to keep your, your responses a little bit shorter than you have been. Um, but I think you've taken us in an interesting uh, direction, Yaziza, because we've got a number of questions in uh, asking about you know, the impact on people. There's one here from Omar. He says, how do you think poverty rates have been affected by COVID-19 and what can be done to help reduce those? So maybe I'll go through it first to Yasu, if I could. Yeah, yes, um, uh, we, we did the um, uh, computation uh, last year and this year, what's the likely impact on poverty and um, encountering a deep negative uh, recession in many countries. Um, it depends on which uh, poverty line we use, 1.9 dollar or uh, 3.2 dollars per day uh, international poverty line. Uh, we um, uh, actually uh, computed uh, 70 million or more than 100 million uh, people falling below poverty line. So actually, uh, this uh, poverty, uh, you know, increasing poverty um, is a very, very uh, serious uh, 
uh, issue, social issue. So again, I think for government uh, to continue um, uh, uh, fiscal measures, you know, in income transfer, in-kind food transfer program, et cetera, et cetera, to support uh, those who are forced falling below poverty, I think that's a very, very critical. And then um, this year, as we uh, already uh, uh, see, um, we can envision, particularly in some uh, uh, higher income countries, uh, positive growth. And positive growth can potentially um, uh, help reduce uh, uh, and mitigate or even alleviate poverty. So I think um, the way uh, this benefit of uh, positive growth and rebound should be um, uh, really inclusive and achieving this uh, inclusive, you know, building back better in general, but uh, uh, better uh, can, uh, should include the uh, inclusive uh, uh, building back. So I think that's the um, uh, very important point. And uh, probably Abdul or uh, from the regional uh, perspective, uh, Lele and uh, Raziza uh, can maybe um, uh, uh, comment uh, on the poverty impact. Sure, please, who wants to go first? Uh, yeah, maybe Karen, I, I can do that. Uh, well, certainly I think um, the poverty situation is, uh, is quite serious. Uh, this is exactly the human dimension. Um, the, this pandemic created new poor and, uh, uh, you know, economists are now perhaps grappling with the effect of how to measure these new vulnerabilities, new poor people who had jobs before and now they lost it because of the pandemic. Um, I, I know this is a question not just for ADB and for country economists, this is also kind of worldwide uh, question that, uh, for example, sustainable development goals, uh, you know, the goal number one, the, the world without poverty, without hunger, um, we will see probably the effects of 2020, uh, not immediately this year, because it's, it's difficult to, to uh, capture these developments. Uh, but there are also different other dimensions, for example, gender. Uh, the very big uh, part of the burden during this pandemic went on women. Um, there are people with disabilities. And of course, there is a big uh, question of inequality, rising inequality in, in our region. Thanks. Thanks very much, Yuliziza. Um, actually, you mentioned uh, women and job losses, but there's a question here from Hannah Fernandez. She's asking about uh, job losses, formal employment in Manila. So maybe I could pass that to you, Abdul. The question is, given the new lockdown in Metro Manila, where you and I are sitting actually, are you expecting a much longer lasting ne negative impact, particularly in formal employment, which of course is, is critical to the poverty we've been talking about? Right, thanks very much for the question, Hannah. Oops, thanks very much for the question, Hannah. Um, actually our Philippine uh, country office here had a, uh, a briefing this morning. And if you take a look at the country chapter on the Philippines in the Asian Development Outlook, they have a special development challenge specifically on this. It talk, talks about uh, um, possible long-term scarring from uh, you know, unemployment or you know, basically the impact on the labor market. So I can, this is actually not specific to, to uh, the Philippines. It's a problem in, uh, in many other countries as well, given how long this pandemic is lasting. We saw unemployment shoot up substantially and it's come down, but it's still not back to normal. And yes, so you have, again, the term economists use is hysteresis. It's sort of, it, uh, it, it lasts long. And what tends to happen in cases like that is people drop out of the labor market, either they get discouraged, some, some of them lose their skills, and therefore, that is a particular issue. So I'd, I'd recommend, if you're interested in this issue, taking a look at that development challenge where they discuss um, you know, the kinds of policies that might, might be able to address this issue. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, if I can add from yes. uh, South Asia. South Asia. Yes. And uh, yeah, we don't have uh, the formal official numbers for poverty and unemployment. Some private sector surveys uh, uh, put uh, unemployment uh, last year in the peak of the national lockdown uh, rising to 30 percent, 40 percent. And this second uh, wave, probably we wouldn't see uh, such a, a big shock because the governments, uh, both uh, center federal government and state governments are taking measures to, to take care of migrant workers in the cities. But we do see some signs of rising unemployment. In terms of poverty, uh, ADB, we do some uh, simulation because, as I said, we don't have surveys. So simulations in India, probably 
the population below $1.9 PPP level could, could double with COVID uh, uh, if uh, compared with uh, without COVID uh, uh, number. So this uh, COVID has a significant impact uh, on the economy and in particular on the informal economy. And we know South Asia has a huge informal sector and the informal sector has been hammered uh, significantly by the COVID. And also informal sector is quite slow to um, um, receive uh, um, uh, subsidies and support from the government is quite difficult. So the fiscal support has to be in place to support uh, uh, the, poor, the poor and the vulnerable, so particularly the informal sector. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, thank Karen, you, thank you. Before we leave the poverty uh, question, I just wanted to refer the audience to, it's figure 1.33 in the report on page 39, where we actually, where the uh, estimates that Lele was talking about, you can find them there. So for developing Asia as a whole, um, with, with, if COVID had not happened, we had expected it to drop to 104 million people under the $1.90 poverty line. But because COVID hit, we, we estimate poverty at 182 million last year. So an additional 78 million people in extreme poverty because of COVID. And then you can also see there how we expect it to evolve this year and next um, because of, uh, you know, as, as the, as, uh, the recovery uh, continues, uh, but basically, even after this year and next, we expect that by 2022, poverty would have dropped back down to 104 million, which is where we would have been without COVID. So it's really set back the poverty reduct the rapid poverty reduction that was happening in the region. It basically stalled it uh, for, for at least a couple of years. Thank you. Thanks very much. And just because we've had a lot of questions about this, yes, this is recorded. Uh, and yes, it will be available on uh, ADB's website. So if any of those numbers uh, are sort of passed you by uh, in the discussion, uh, you'll be able to see that later. Of course, the report is online as well. Um, I want to go to, um, maybe I'll go back to Lele and then to Liaziza because we had a question in uh, on Facebook about remittances and the impact on remittances in Bangladesh, Pakistan and Azerbaijan. Um, yeah, so you mentioned uh, remittances that sort of held up uh, during a presentation, but perhaps I could go to Lele and then Liaziza, please. Okay, thank you, Karen. And remittance is a very interesting phenomenon. In South Asia, we see some different trends. For India, the remittance coming back to India actually has been falling uh, in last fiscal year. And then the remittance going to, say, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka have been rising strongly, like to Bangladesh, uh, uh, I can't remember exact number, it's close to 10% or over. Although Bangladesh has uh, put some measures and uh, then uh, they, they put some uh, incentive, 2% uh, cash incentives if you uh, put the remittance back. And we, we think there are several reasons, probably one of the reasons because uh, um, uh, migrant workers uh, going back home and left their job uh, in other countries, then they probably they send all the remittance back uh, in one time. And the other major contributor, I believe, actually, is the shifting of the remittance, remitting through informal channels to the formal channels, particularly through uh, those uh, electronic payment uh, platforms. So that uh, might play a significant role. So we shall see how remittance perform in the coming months whether they just uh, once off uh, shifting or whether they would uh, enduring uh, the COVID impact, we shall see. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Liaziza, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you again. Yes, uh, sure, remittances for the smaller uh, Central Asian economies, they play a large role from you know, estimates uh, previously from 30 to 40% of GDP. And of course, at the beginning of last year, when uh, countries imposed lockdowns, uh, there was this huge fear, what will happen to this very significant inflow of funds, which uh, in a way play a role of a social kind of protection uh, for people. And uh, indeed, in the first half of last year, remittances from Russia, which is the main key destination for migrant uh, workers from Central Asia, they declined by like 25%, by a quarter, which is a quite significant number. However, by the end of the year, things uh, the, the numbers were, were did not come up as 
but as we all have been worried about this. So there were different effects and we are, of course, analyzing it now. So on one hand, for example, when uh, Russia imposed travel bans early on, of course, this had very negative effect because there were really literally horror stories of migrants stuck at the border not being able to go here or there. Uh, but then, uh, then uh, in the second half of the year, actually Russia had a little bit less strict uh, lockdowns. Um, so, uh, you know, people were able to work and uh, um, at, at the same time also different conflicting factors. Uh, on one hand, uh, uh, migrant workers uh, tended to work as seasonal, uh, in the short term work in the informal sector, which are more vulnerable for lockdowns. On the other hand, they are also employed in kind of essential sectors, such as catering or construction or maybe care economy. So different factors played role. And I also uh, agree with Lele when he mentioned that uh, maybe the this uh, factor, the fact that people were forced to send remittances now through official channels, uh, financial channels, rather than carrying cash with uh, them, uh, as was the case often before, maybe that also played a role in better capturing of remittances. So um, also just very shortly, Karen, if I may, one minute, um, I think uh, what the story on remittances is actually a testament of people resilience and adaptability. You know, there was a huge shock at the beginning of the year, in the spring of last year, sometimes even in summer. But then, uh, you know, by the end of the year, people, those who were staying in the recipient countries, they adjusted their life and, and somehow um, uh, of course continued sending this needed money back home. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Let's stick on that jobs topic. There's a question here from uh, Maria. Uh, sorry, Mario, excuse my eyes. Is COVID-19 generating unemployment at the same time as it's generating inflation? Um, maybe I can come to Yasu first for that. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, uh, inflation, uh, actually, uh, as I briefly mentioned uh, in, in my uh, initial presentation, Inflation pressure is not necessarily um, uh, high last year and this year and even uh, next year. The reason behind this is um, uh, price level and the change rate inflation is really uh, determined by a balance of uh, uh, supply and demand uh, for goods and services. Um, while uh, COVID-19 really disrupted the supply side, but at the same time um, uh, demand uh, shrunk substantially. So far, uh, this balance seems to be um, uh, really uh, under uh, we're under control. Uh, so I think um, uh, while supply side disruption and the losing jobs, unemployment is happening, but we don't see um, uh, uh, quite a clear sign of inflation pressure over our uh, uh, two-year forecast horizon. So probably, uh, Abdul, maybe you can uh, follow up if you want. Oh, that's perfect. That, that's precisely it. Uh, it. Some supply side disruptions, but some supply side disruptions, but temporary. Nothing to add. Okay, well, maybe now we can look back quickly and then look a little bit forward. We've got a question here challenging your forecasts, guys, um, from Solita. How accurate was <clears throat> ADB's forecast for 2020 growth by region? Sure. I'm happy to <laughs> how, take How that. well did you do? I'm happy to take that also because uh, for those who don't know, uh, Professor Monsoud is the, the best economics professor at UP for in, in history. So <laughs> um, yes, at, at Professor Monsoud, it was, uh, uh, we, uh, we, everybody was challenged, including us forecasting last year, as you know, uh, in March, it looked like it was just a China, a, 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 an outbreak in China, and then it quickly morphed into a global crisis. What I can say, so what I can say is that um, uh, we, we did well, be, I'll give you one metric against the IMF forecasts, IMF forecasts in April at the same time as us were much more pessimistic and then they basically adjusted up. I guess we had more faith in uh, how, in, in the resilience of Asian economies. And then by the, by the time, you know, as when it was clearer uh, by, you know, by the second half of the year, how things were evolving, our, our forecasts were even better. We were within uh, half a percentage point of actual outcomes for, um, what was it, um, for a, a, good, a good number of, countries in the region. So well enough uh, under the circumstances. Thank you for the question. Can so I add, add one, a little bit more? 
Sure, go ahead. I believe David. actually uh, ERCD uh, a couple of years ago, several years ago, uh, somebody has done a research comparing uh, forecasts from uh, major multilateral organizations, including World Bank, IMF, or OECD, and ADB. I think uh, ADB's forecasts were not bad. And yep. comparing to IMF, probably we, are, we were better than the IMF. And if you look at the India's forecasts, yeah, I have uh, had uh, constantly interaction with uh, IMF for our forecasting uh, group, uh, the mission, uh, India mission, as well as World Bank forecasting teams. We compare our <laughs> forecast. So I would say uh, until now, we are uh, doing quite well. And uh, uh, two days ago, I spoke to the IMF mission chief for, for India. And uh, he said he, they, they forecast 12.5 uh, for this fiscal year. And they said, he said uh, they want to be ahead of the curve but then probably a little bit too ahead of the curve. Because when they made, made the forecast, it was uh, the second wave just started. That's in late uh, February, late, early March. So I stopped here. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, paper, the paper mentioned by uh, Lele is uh, written by uh, 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 Ben Noferani, uh, one of the our ERCD uh, senior economists. And uh, he put out the two working paper, uh, ADB working paper, uh, which can be uh, accessed through uh, ADB website. And according to these papers, basically our um, uh, forecast performance is quite good, especially for uh, smaller uh, uh, countries and economy in Asia and Pacific. So I think uh, this is really endorsing uh, ADB as a home doctor of uh, Asian Pacific region. Um, and uh, we are providing a quite good diagon diagnosis uh, for uh, our uh, member countries and economies. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You heard it here, Professor, but you know, we're always, we're always happy to engage in a debate, as you can tell here. Okay, so let's look forward then. Um, there's a question here about the economic impact of the school closures. How did you estimate that? Uh, Abdul, do you want to take that? I'll, I'll make it quick, given that I can see there's so many questions. Uh, the, it, the, it, you can read more details in the report, but basically the idea was you know, we know we know the extent of the school closures. We know that uh, many economies undertook remote learning strategies, but we also know that those are not as effective as uh, in-person learning. And so, what we have there are various scenarios on the effectiveness of remote learning relative to in-person. And we also know that that varies by country income level. Uh, that higher income countries have better access to uh, computers, the internet, etc. And so we use those to um, adjust the effectiveness of remote learning. So that's one. The other element is that we also account for the fact that uh, some students will drop out because of uh, you know because of the uh, the shock. So that so there was income loss, we uh, higher unemployment, and therefore our estimates are that an additional half a million students uh, in developing Asia dropped out uh, last year because of the pandemic. And so we combine those estimates to get an estimate of learning loss. And then from that, there are estimates in the economic literature of for each year of schooling you lose, you basically, your earnings drop by about 10%. So we're able to translate that into uh, future earning losses. Then we just calculate the present value. You can look at it in the report. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Now we have another question from Iskandar. What sectors of the economy or in Asia's leading economies do you see as drivers for growth? Digitization, medicine, health, something else. Can I ask you to respond really, really quickly so that we can get to some of the other questions? Oh uh, yeah, uh, Yes, I think uh, in order to achieve uh, inclusive recovery and also tackling um, uh, the uh, poverty issues, uh, as well as uh, uh, even remittance, you know, smooth remittance uh, transfer, I think digitalization is really the key to achieve a uh, um, uh, inclusive uh, rebound of the economy. And uh, like us, uh, online um, uh, uh, meetings and uh, online education, as Abdul said, and uh, also work from home arrangement, I think enabling environment through digitalization, this is really um, uh, important, a critical component, how we can continue our economy. And uh, having said this, um, while uh, digitalization can generate enormous uh, economic gain, actually we have uh, another report, Asian Econ Integration Report, released in uh, February, saying that the 1.7 trillion US dollars gains or uh, also creating a 65 million new jobs. Enormous gain, but at the same time, this is like a double-edged sword, uh, digital divide. 
um, as Abdul um, mentioned, uh, you know, online learning, uh, there are lots of challenges for especially poor uh, kids. So how to uh, narrow down um, uh, emerging uh, digital dividing education and also work from home and jobs um, uh, and uh, uh, labor market, as well as uh, shopping and continuing uh, consumption. I think how to narrow down uh, digital divide while, while maximizing benefit, uh, that's uh, really important. So government can do a lot of things uh, like uh, making uh, uh, digital infrastructure more uh, viable and affordable, especially for the poor, and also for micro enterprises to gain out of the uh, 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 you know digital platform. I think fair competition policy play a key role, especially for uh, small businesses. And also at the same time, government should uh, put the extra care to tackle a privacy issue and cyber security issue. So I think digitalization is really key uh, for. Uh, very strong rebound of uh, Asian economy. Thanks. Uh, Liaziza and then Lele, please. Yeah, I just also wanted to add uh, something which is very relevant, I think, to resource-rich economies. Uh, this pandemic really brought forward the day when um, the demand uh, for oil would be far less than the supply of oil in the long term. And it is really a kind of wake up call for many governments. So the thing is that uh, as a future driver uh, for, for growth, um, for governments is really how to make investments in infrastructure green and how to make um, uh, the, the growth uh, really uh, friendly uh, in, in a sustainable way. Um, there are estimates now by, by these experts that um, we are on the second, this year, 2021, is on the trend to become the second um, year with the largest emissions, uh, carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Uh, which is a big uh, surprising outcome given the um, situation last year. So, uh, and we've seen, by the way, we've seen a similar dynamics after the uh, global financial crisis in 2008. So a big challenge, and not only for Central Asian governments, but I think worldwide, it, this is relevant for Asia Pacific overall, is really how to make this recovery not fossil fuel. So how to make a green sustainable recovery. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, for South Asia, I think uh, the priority, even uh, in the medium term, uh, become a, a driver of economic growth is still the investment in health, health and education. Uh, because the lack of uh, investment in health education in past decades, which uh, um, uh, probably was one of the reasons why the surge in South Asia was so uh, uh, alarming and worry, worrying. And, uh, and this virus, COVID-19, uh, is so nasty. And we don't know whether there's ever to be a, a third wave, the fourth wave, or even fourth, fifth wave, because vaccines might become ineffective against this virus. So continuing investing in health, immediate uh, priority, probably also the medium and long-term priority on, on uh, health and education. And I agree with uh, uh, our chief economist, digital transformation, he would be uh, underpinning all this transformation of the economy. And uh, in the Indian chapter of the ADO, we discussed uh, about the digital transformation in India, which uh, has accelerated a lot during the pandemic. And the other major issue for South Asia is we need to strengthen, improve competitiveness of South Asian economies. South Asian economies have been benefited from globalization, but not to the extent as in East and Southeast Asia. And uh, a lot of uh, domestic issues uh, have hampered the uh, competitiveness enhancement, which led to the exports uh, uh, cannot be competitive uh, in the international markets. And then we need to do a lot of reforms to strengthen and to improve competitiveness. And then um, uh, South Asian economies at least can continue to benefit from uh, globalization, which although there are some talks about deglobalization, but I believe globalization is still a trend and still do continue in the world. Back to you, Karen, thank you. Thanks, I think we're, we're running very close to the top of the hour, but I do want to squeeze 
um, a couple more in. So I'm going to put two questions together, um, if I may, um, Abdul. It's about um, how can ASEAN promote active collaboration to re reinvigorate economies? And there is another question about trade tensions. How are trade tensions going to be impacting economies? And I know you've done a lot of work in this area. Okay, let me take the second question, Karen, and pass the first to Yasu. So on trade tensions, um, there's really, despite the change in administration in the US, there hasn't been much of a change in, in terms of the tensions between China and the US, both on the trade front and in terms of technology. So the tariffs that were put in place in 2018 and 2019 are still there. Uh, there was a phase one agreement where China had promised to import a certain amount. It didn't happen because of the pandemic. Uh, and basically, there have been initial negotiations between the Biden administration and uh, Chinese authorities, uh, but uh, nothing has changed. And, and right now, uh, uh, we don't expect anything to change. The technology tensions are also there, and we talk about the risks of decoupling. You can take a look at it. But right now, what, what it is, it's, it's a risk. It's not clear. Uh, there, there's a possibility that it'll intensify. There's also the possibility that it will, uh, you know, things will improve uh, between the two countries, but we, there's more discussion of that in the report. Let me pass to Yas, Yasu about the, what ASEAN can do in terms of, uh, you know, improving integration. Uh, yes, uh, I think um, regional cooperation among ASEAN uh, countries and members are quite uh, critical uh, in all the as aspects, uh, trade, investment, and uh, uh, financial uh, safety net. Uh, actually, I'd like to uh, mention uh, about the uh, uh, macro financial stability. As I uh, briefly touch upon in my presentation, there is a potential risk of a taper tantrum uh, uh, happening and hitting Asia's uh, emerging market. In order to cushion against uh, such a potential negative spillovers from the global shock, I think a regional uh, uh, financial safety net play a very, very critical role. And ASEAN and ASEAN Plus 3 has a, a framework called the Chiang Initiative Materialization, CMIM, and also ASEAN Plus 3 uh, Macroeconomic Research Office, AMRO, has been taking a, a lead to uh, uh, provide a surveillance of uh, um, a potential financial risks. So I think uh, uh, on top of this, also important to develop a nurture and deepen local currency uh, bond markets. Uh, to alleviate uh, uh, currency mismatch and maturity mismatch, so-called um, uh, 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 dual uh, mismatch problem. So I think um, uh, this uh, uh, area uh, providing a very, very uh, strong uh, uh, regional safety net, I think uh, ASEAN uh, and ASEAN plus three regional cooperation uh, will play, has been and will play a critical role. And ADB has been always support, supporting of a CMIM, AMRO, and development of local currency bond market in the region. And finally, I'd like to touch upon, uh, in spite of this uh, uh, COVID uh, outbreak, uh, end of uh, last year, 2020, uh, um, emerging East Asia's local currency bond market has reached uh, 20 uh, trillion US dollars as a market size. 18% higher than the uh, year area. So I think uh, this uh, trend should be continued and strengthened through uh, you know, regional cooperation uh, among the ASEAN, ASEAN plus three uh, members. Thanks very much, Yasu. Thanks. Ending on a positive note, that's great. A vigorous discussion. We're at the top of the hour, so I'm afraid we have to leave it there. But as I mentioned, the full uh, Asian Development Outlook report is on the ADB website, www.adb.org. A recording will be there as well. Before you go, I'd just like to let you know, because there were a lot of questions about some of these issues, that ADB will be kicking off its annual uh, meeting uh, on the 3rd of May. Um, you will be holding a lot more discussions along, along the lines of a lot of the issues that many of you raised today, economic issues, development issues with policymakers, uh, economists, the private sector and more. Uh, please again go to the ADB website to register for that. Then uh, on the 12th of May, our next Asian Impact webinar will gather experts from inside and outside ADB to talk about how Asia and the Pacific can finance a green and inclusive recovery from the pandemic. I saw many of those questions coming in. We just weren't able to get to them. There were so many questions, but you will have another opportunity. So please tune in again on the 12th of May. So that leaves me to thank you, the audience. Thank you for participating. And also to our panelists, Yasu, Abdul, Liaziza, and Lele Song. Thank you and until next time. <laughs>